Great, so thanks for coming. So what I'm going to be talking about today is something I'm really excited about. It's different than the usual types of things I work on. So this will be great because we'll learn about an area together. So I got interested um, a little bit ago in problems in approximate counting and sampling, mostly because I was interested in doing inference in machine learning problems. But let me tell you a nice story from this setup. So what I'm going to be talking about today is I'm going to give you a new approach for approximate counting and sampling. And what's exciting about this approach is that it's going to work for problems with higher order constraints. And it's going to work even in situations where the things you're counting or the things you want to sample from aren't even connected in the natural way. So how exactly are you going to run things like Markov chains to try and find the set of satisfying solutions? But before I get to higher order counting and sampling problems, I first want to start off with a simpler problem with just binary pairwise constraints. So there's an important problem in approximate counting called counting independent sets. <coughs> this is often called counting independent sets in the hardcore model. So the input to the problem is you're given some graph G and some bounded degree delta. And the goal is what you want to do <coughs> is you want to sample an independent set with some probability proportional to lambda to the size of the independent set. And here lambda is usually called the inverse temperature or the fugosity. Now the important way to think about it is that as lambda gets larger and larger, meaning that the temperature is going down because it's the inverse temperature, then you're isolating yourself more and more to the large independent sets in your graph. And as lambda gets larger, so the inverse temperature is going up, then, uh, sorry, gets smaller, then this problem becomes easier because you get closer and closer to being uniform. So just for some nomenclature, so what we really care about is we can either care about the counting version of the problem, where we have this partition function z, which is the sum over all independent sets in the graph of lambda to the size of i. We could want to do something like multiplicatively approximate this partition function. Or we could have the approximate sampling version of the problem, where we want to sample from a distribution that's close to this resulting distribution on independent sets. So <clears throat> the natural question in approximate counting and sampling literature is when is it algorithmically possible to do this? When can we algorithmically count and sample? For what values of lambda can we hope to do this? And a very famous result of Dror Weitz is what he gave was he gave a deterministic algorithm, <coughs> which what it does, it multiplicatively approximates the partition function within any one plus epsilon factor you want, so it outputs this z tilde. And it works provided that lambda is at most this funny function of delta. So this bound might look strange, but it's actually very natural for many different reasons. <coughs> so just to take a step back, so the running time of this algorithm, it's polynomial in 1 over epsilon, so you can get any target accuracy you want. It's polynomial in n, the number of nodes in the graph. But it is exponential in whatever this upper bound max degree delta is. So this is one side, is that we know something we can do algorithmically about approximate counting. Uh, and it also yields something for approximate sampling in a pretty straightforward way. <coughs> and what's pretty amazing is that this funny function of delta is tight. So a beautiful work of Alan Sly, which was really a breakthrough, showed that actually the problem becomes NP-hard beyond that. So for any lambda, <laughs> which is strictly larger than that function of delta, then actually approximating the partition function to some multiplicative factor becomes NP-hard. <coughs> and actually it turns out that the same type of thing can carry over to approximate sampling, that if you could approximately sample in these situations, you would have NP is contained in RP. Now Sly's work uh, didn't work for all values of lambda, and it had some restrictions, and there was this later paper of Galanis et al., which extended it to a broader range of settings. But this is a wonderfully tight threshold. We asked this basic question about approximate counting and sampling, and we got a really strong and complete answer, that it's possible if and only if lambda is smaller than this quantity. So this is a great situation because actually, there are many ways to think about this threshold that span a lot of different fields. So approximate counting and sampling spans many different fields. It has a long and storied history in statistical physics, probability, and analysis. And there are many ways to think about why this threshold is natural and what happens around it. 
So I'm going to tell you a little bit just for background about what happens at those thresholds, but then we're going to see that this sort of cohesive story where all these different viewpoints converge to the same answer in problems that we understand is much more subtle and complicated in counting problems with higher order constraints for things we don't understand. So one of the most powerful notions is what's called correlation decay. So informally what this means is that there are no long range dependencies. So the problem somehow becomes pretty local. So it means that for any configuration, well, more precisely, if you take any node X and you look at the set of nodes which are distance R away from it in the graph, and you fix some configuration of what's in the independent set and what's out of the independent set, that any choice of that configuration is going to have a negligible effect on the probability that X is either in or out of the independent set. That's the notion of correlation decay. <coughs> now it's a worst case notion because it's really a statement about any boundary configuration at some distance R. And what you really care about is that more precisely, for any configuration on the boundary, the change in the marginal distribution at X goes to zero as R goes to infinity. So if you want some one plus epsilon approximation to your problem, you only need to go out maybe something like a logarithmic distance in order to accomplish that. Uh, so for any, so then, um, so you need that it actually is a realizable configuration and then subject to that you need this correlation decay. But thanks for the question. All right, so uh, Weitz, what he actually showed, one way to think about what his result was, was it was actually a beautiful way to understand correlation decay on general graphs just through correlation decay on trees. When you have correlation decay on trees, the problem becomes much simpler to understand when it does and doesn't happen because all of these problems are disjoint from each other and you can actually build up a recurrence and correlation decay is really some contractive property of the recurrence as you do induction up the tree. So what he showed was the surprising fact that actually if you look at the general case for general graphs, there's a really clever way to look at self-avoiding walks that turns your problem into a tree with some appropriate boundary configuration where having correlation decay on that tree is equivalent to having correlation decay in your original graph. And then that threshold of how lambda needs to relate to delta comes out of understanding recurrence properties on trees in terms of correlation decay. So for bounded degree trees, you get correlation decay if and only if you have this type of property. <coughs> All right, so there's in fact another way. So that was one way, just through something known as correlation decay, to try and understand when the problem becomes easy. And that provides some algorithmic leverage. Because once you can turn your graph into a tree, and you can do recurrences on it to be able to compute marginal probabilities, that becomes your algorithmic approach. You go out to some distance in your tree, you cut out everything after that, and you do something recursive to figure out your marginals. There's a totally different way of doing things too, which is called Glauber dynamics. So here you have a Markov chain on the space of valid solutions. This is some configuration again of which nodes are in the independent set and which things are out of the independent set. And what you do is you just choose a random node and you forget whether it's in or out of your independent set. And then all you do is you try the two different choices of either putting it in or putting it out. If those are both valid configurations, you have the problem of choosing which transition to go to. And what you can do is because you know what particular distribution you want to converge to, you know what the ratio of their probabilities are in the steady state. It just depends on lambda. And you can select which of these states to go to with the right probability so that your Markov chain would actually converge to the distribution you want to sample from. So this is called Glauber dynamics. And what's important about this setup is that this Markov chain, you really care about when it mixes quickly. But just to make sure we're on the same page, this Markov chain is happening on an exponentially large state space because there are exponentially many configurations of what's in and what's out of the independent set. So really you're asking when does this Markov chain in exponentially many states mix in something which is polynomial in time, so logarithmic in the number of states. And it turns out that this is exactly the same phase transition as the one we saw before when Glauber dynamics mixes quickly and when it doesn't. So this um, goes back to work of Struk and Zagorinsky in 94 for some special cases of graphs, grid-like graphs. Dyer et al. gave a really nice combinatorial argument which really says that for graphs of polynomial growth, you get rapid mixing if and only if there is a correlation decay. 
So actually even this notion of correlation decay is intrinsically related to whether or not this Markov chain quickly mixes within its state space. Polynomial growth meaning radius r is r to the... Yeah, that's right. In fact, it needs just sub-exponential and then you get a worse dependence on it and that actually comes out of the Dyer style approaches. And it's even simpler if you don't consider the, uh, the Glauber dynamics, but multi-state updates. And that's also in uh, Weitz's thesis. So there's even one other perspective, which is when the distribution is unique on infinite trees. See, I defined a distribution on uh, the independent sets in a graph, but when you talk about infinite graphs, you have to be much more careful because there can be more than one distribution that actually meets all of the local constraints that you impose upon it. So this is the notion of uniqueness of the Gibbs measure, and you can ask the question, you know, for what values of lambda and delta is the Gibbs measure on infinite trees unique? And that turns out to be if and only if correlation decay happens. And there's one last connection, which is you can even connect this to complex analysis. There are what are called Li-Yang theorems, that when you look at the partition function, but you put in complex values, understanding where the zeros of that function happen in the complex plane tells you where there is this type of phase transition from the problem going from easy to computationally hard. So just to summarize all of this background, this was just meant as a tutorial, a little bit about some of the things that I learned about approximate counting and sampling, is what's wonderful is that the problems we understand, we understand very well. We understand them so thoroughly that we can see them from many different vantage points and they all give the same answer. You know, it turns out that when you talk about for problems like sampling independent sets in the hardcore model, all of these thresholds happen together for the same relationship between lambda and delta. When there's correlation decay, when fixing states of nodes far away has negligible effect on any other node U, it also is the same exact threshold where the Gibbs measure is unique on infinite trees. It's also where temporal mixing happens when Glauber <coughs> dynamics mixes in time logarithmic in the number of states in the underlying Markov chain, so in polynomial time. And it's even, courtesy of Sly and Weitz's work, the computational threshold too. Because it's not only do other standard techniques like Glauber dynamics break down when lambda starts becoming too large as a function of delta, in fact, it's because the problem is fundamentally computationally hard beyond that. So this is a really complete picture where all of these different perspectives tell us the same exact threshold. But now what I want to understand, and this is what really got me interested in these things, is when we talk about sampling and counting, is correlation decay all that there is? So I claim that there are actually some settings, especially with higher order dependencies, where correlation decay isn't all that there is, and there are wide gaps in our understanding about what's algorithmically possible, that there are situations where we can approximately sample and count even when correlation decay fails. And so this talk, I'm gonna give you an algorithm that I uh, discovered while trying to answer these types of questions. And um, the algorithm is pretty strange to me, even. Um, so it's a little bit bizarre in the way that it circumvents the fact that the solution space is not connected. So I'm hopefully gonna give you a hint of what the ingredients are in this, but first I wanna introduce the main problem that I care about, which is now I've so far talked about counting problems with pairwise constraints, binary constraints. These are the counting independent sets. Let's move on to counting problems in higher order constraints. So I wanna start off with monotone CNF formulas. So here, for example, you're given some CNF formula, so it's an and of ors, but it's monotone in the sense that none of the variables appear complemented. So they're all, you know, uh, if you set all true, you get that this formula is true. So there's definitely a satisfying assignment. But you can ask the question about whether you can approximately count the number of satisfying assignments. And here we're gonna have two constraints we're gonna impose on what types of monotone CNF problems we care about. And the counting literature, there are two natural properties to look at of the CNF. One is the width. We'll say that it has width k if there are at least k variables per clause. And we're gonna say that it has dependency degree at most d if every clause intersects at most d other clauses. So you can really think about this if you want as like some type of hyperedge where you know, all the other hyperedges that it shares a variable with are things which contribute to the degree. 
And so the basic question I want to understand is, this is certainly a problem with higher order constraints <coughs> because of how much each clause can depend on many other clauses and how many variables occur in each individual clause. But can we approximately count the number of satisfying assignments for these types of problems? So I want to tell you a little bit about the prior work to tell you that actually there are some approximate counting problems where there are just wide gaps in what we know. So there they study something slightly different because they study it in the hypergraph setting. So they let D be the maximum number of clauses any variable appears in. That's a bit smaller than the max that any clause can intersect with other clauses. But for this talk, you know, we're going to take the degree to be exponential in the width. So you should, at a first cut, just think about capital D and little d as being roughly the same thing. Uh, it's much easier to think about it there. So what Bezikov et al. showed was that actually the problem becomes NP-hard as soon as the degree d becomes 2 to the k over 2. In fact, it becomes hard to get it right within an exponential factor. <clears throat> and on the algorithmic side, what do we know? All we know is that if the degree is at most k minus 2, then we can do it. So this is a huge gap. You know, can we count in higher order in counting problems with higher order constraints in situations where the degree is exponential in the width? Or can we only do it when the degree is linear in the width? And I'm going to explain that actually these types of thresholds were the limitation of the types of techniques we used because the reason they broke down there was because of the failure of correlation decay beyond this threshold. So can we count when the degree is exponential in the width? So let me first tell you what our main results are. So actually if you take general CNFs now which are not even monotone, so they have even complements, you know, negated variables, things become very complicated there. Um, it turns out that there's a deterministic algorithm that can approximately count the number of satisfying assignments even when the degree is exponential in the width. So it's some 2 to the k over 60. I have no idea what the right constant should be there, uh, but it's a very interesting question to understand what are the limits of these techniques, how do they fit in with the other things that people know in approximate counting and what's actually going on here. And so what this does, just to be precise, is it outputs an approximation in the same sense as before. It outputs a value, which is within a 1 plus or minus epsilon of the number of satisfying assignments for the CNF formula. Now the degree, just like in Weitz's thing, depends exponentially on this maximum degree. You should think about it as a constant for simplicity. But a very interesting question is that, you know, this is typical for deterministic algorithms for these counting problems. You could hope that there is some randomized algorithm that even improves this dependence on the max degree. Of course, you have the subtlety that there's no longer an obvious randomized algorithm because the solution space isn't even connected, so I don't know how to define a Markov chain. So what's cool is that once I tell you this technique, it's going to extend to lots of other settings. It's not limited to binary things. It can even work with you know, higher colored problems. So imagine you have some sort of constraint satisfaction problem. But instead of your variables taking true and false assignments, what if they take colors? Red, green, and blue, and you can have constraints on those colors like in every clause, not all of the cl uh, colors are equal. So these types of things are going to you know, happen for free out of these types of techniques. Now we get an identical result for sampling that under the same sort of setup where the degree is exponential in the width, there's an algorithm that outputs a random satisfying assignment where the total variation distance between this distribution of the algorithm's output and the uniform distribution on satisfying assignments is at most epsilon for any epsilon you want. So this is just the sampling analog of the counting result that I already talked about. Yep? Just a trivial question. Uh, so suppose k is 1,000, right? Mm -hmm. Very large. The bound is still vacuous. Mm -hmm. The d being between k to the fifth and to the... Uh, you're going to get machine learning people banned from this. Yeah. <laughs> no, no. I agree. Okay. Oh, with so one. What, do you tell, what does it tell us? <laughs> so it tells us that there are actually techniques that can work even when the solution space is disconnected. Now, what are the limits of when you can do sampling? So if you think about, I mean, to take a step back, right? So um, I don't know if I want to answer this question yet, but essentially there are, there are even simple graphical models where when you're trying to do inference in them, you're actually, you can set up graphical models where you're trying to sample from this distribution. That's how I came to this problem. 
And the prevailing wisdom is that you know you can run Gibbs samplers or things like this when the posterior distribution is nicely unimodal or some other structural property. But even when it's not, I hope there are things you can do. There's at least one thing that's outside that class of algorithms. All right, so uh, around the same time, there was actually a bunch of work on these types of problems. So Herman, Sly, and Zhang. What they showed was that in the monotone case, they can get up to D being at least you know, 2 to the K over 2. Now, monotone is a little bit subtle. No, there's another situation, Guo, Jerem, and Liu, showed that you can also get up to the same threshold about D is 2 to the K over 2. If every pair of intersecting clauses either overlaps you know, hugely or doesn't overlap at all. So you can think about you know, when d is exponential in k, that you either need to overlap by a linear in k number of variables or not at all. So in that situation, people were actually able to design Markov chains for these types of problems. In fact, in the monotone case, your solution space actually is connected because you can always get to the all true assignment. <laughs> and in this situation, there's a different Markov chain based on cycle popping that works. So, um, and actually what's interesting is that these results in these special cases are tight. They're NP-hard above this threshold because of the Bezikova et al. result. So on the one hand, we understand for simpler problems exactly what the threshold is, but for harder problems like non-monotone CNFs where they're not connected, we don't really know anything besides one isolated statement. So now I want to dig into it and give you some intuition. So the first thing I want to do is I want to understand this picture about how all of these results, these different viewpoints, coincide in the case of counting independent sets. What goes wrong when you talk about higher order constraints? So let's look at the failure of correlation decay when we talk about higher order counting problems. And just so I can pictorially represent it, let's talk about nodes as being colored red or green where we have you know, hyper edges. So if I create some type of configuration of hyperedges this way, where it's really just a tree of hyperedges, I actually can create arbitrarily long dependencies as soon as the degree is at least k minus 1. The reason for that is that you know, originally this node, if I look at the uniform distribution on assignments, where every clause contains at least one red and one green color, the uniform distribution here is 50-50 on x's value being red or green. There's no specialty to which color. But as soon as I fix a boundary condition very far out, I have a bunch of red. This all of a sudden forces things. You know, the next layer has to be all green, which then forces the next thing to be red. And I can do the same forcing further out and force all along the paths in this tree until x is no longer 50-50, but it's deterministic. So this is as soon as the degree is at least k minus 1, correlation decay is out the window. It's just not true. And this is exactly what this Bourdais, which algorithm is relying on. It relies on path coupling through correlation decay. But that's why it only works up to d is k minus 2. So now let's look at what I'm going to call the stratification of these thresholds. So this is what makes the problem complicated, is how different the different perspectives behave. So we know that for approximate counting and bounded degree CNFs, Correlation decay fails when d is at least k minus 1. We know that uniqueness fails. It, it turns out this is a result of Bezikova, even when the problem is NP-hard. So it's NP-hard at d is 2 to the k over 2. But even above that, when d is about 2 to the k, actually the Gibbs measure on trees is unique. So the problem, is, the problem has a unique Gibbs measure even when it's NP-hard to approximately count and sample. Temporal mixing in the non-monotone case, I don't even know what a randomized algorithm is for traversing these disconnected components. And computationally, we're trying to ask this question, what is the right answer for the relationship between the degree and the width, where counting is possible? All right, so this was the background. So now what I hope to do, I've saved myself a bunch of time to do this, I want to give you a hint about what this technique is. So it's. Um, it's actually a thought experiment. It won't be clear until the end that it's actually an algorithm. But let's just try and understand the, the structure of the solutions. Now, the first thing that many of you might have thought about when I've been describing his problems is that, boy, it sounds a lot like he's talking about something called the Lovas local lemma. And you would be correct. So let me tell you another way to think about these problems, which is going to be very powerful for an algorithmic way to think about what to do.
So the Lovas local lemma is this fundamental tool in probabilistic combinatorics, which roughly says that if you have a collection of events, even with bounded dependencies between them, there's still a way to say that there's a positive probability that none of the bad events occur. You can think about this in the special case, a really well-known corollary applies the CNF formulas, non-monotone ones, where if you have some dependency degree D, that's why it shows capital D to be the dependence between the events. For each clause, how many other clauses can it intersect? As long as E times D is at most Q to the K, then a fundamental result in probabilistic combinatorics is that there is a satisfying solution to that CNF formula. You're guaranteed that there exists one. And, but what's interesting about this is the fact that the random assignments in the setting can be exponentially rare. So if you choose a random assignment, you can still be exponentially unlikely to satisfy the formula even though you know that there are many that do. So a beautiful result of Moser and Tardos actually made this constructive. It showed that when E times D is at most 2 to the K, that not only do you know information theoretically that there exists a satisfying assignment even though they're rare, you can even find one. And it's a very simple, elegant algorithm. All it does is it almost looks like a randomized algorithm. It, um, it you know, starts off with a random assignment. When there's an unsatisfied clause, it re-randomizes the variables. And through an entropy argument, it proves that it terminates very quickly under these kinds of conditions. So we can think about the types of questions we're asking as, you know, the constructive local lemma is really saying that when the local lemma guarantees are true for the CNF formula, we can find it algorithmically, courtesy of Moser and Tardosh. <coughs> and what I'm really asking is under local lemma-like conditions, can you not only find a satisfying assignment, but can you approximately sample from the uniform distribution on them, or can you approximately count the number that there are? And what's interesting is that the first time you see it this way, as I'm asking for a random sampling version of the local lemma, you could be really optimistic. You could hope, well, you know, there was this information theoretic result a long time ago that you know, under those local lemma conditions, there is a satisfying assignment. And eventually, we know how to construct one. So you could hope that maybe there's just a randomized algorithm that works all the way up to the threshold. One of the interesting synergies between these different fields on the local lemma on one side and approximate counting on the other is that we know that you can't. So remember that at that threshold of 2 to the k over 2, the problem actually becomes NP-hard. So you can't get all the way to the limit of the local lemma solutions. So not only is the moser tardos algorithm, when you look at it as a randomized algorithm, biased in the solutions it finds, but it's fundamentally biased because if it weren't, you could solve NP-hard problems. No, but I mean, those of us who didn't grow up with the moser tardos algorithm, uh, I mean, there was the back approach. I agree. And that just fall, decomposed the graph. Right. We'll get into that. Wait. So I'm going to use Beck-style approach. What's tricky about that, just to answer the question that you're heading towards, see, that explores the graph, but how do you know that the decisions you make and then you know, re, uh, remake some decisions doesn't create bias in the things that you... Uh, you know, I'm not yeah. saying I know the analysis, I'm just saying that yeah. it's a leading question to say... Great. To talk about we will talk about that in a few minutes. <laughs> okay, so in fact, let me tell you one useful local lemma fact. There's a lot known about the constructive local lemma. So it turns out that you know, when you strengthen the local lemma conditions, instead of the degree being 2 to the k, but you take a step back, it's 2 to the k over 10, it's 2 to the k over 60, <coughs> then your solution space becomes much nicer to understand. So locally, a random satisfying assignment looks kind of random in some quantitative senses. So even though they're exponentially rare, you don't see that when you look at just these partial views of it. So let me make this more precise. So if we let script D denote the uniform distribution on satisfying assignments, then there's this really nice lemma that if you take a step back off of the local lemma threshold, so instead of E times D being at most 2 to the K, what if it's E times D times S, some parameter S is at most 2 to the K? So that factor of S is how much you're stepping off of the threshold. Then if you look at the uniform distribution on satisfying assignments, the probability that xi is true is bounded between 1 half minus 2 over s and 1 half plus 2 over s. So as you actually increase s and are allowing for a weaker exponential relationship between these, locally each individual variable 
is becoming closer and closer to uniform. Now what's tricky is that the way that it's becoming closer and closer to uniform, k is a constant for us. So it's just becoming still a constant close to uniform. That's still not enough. If you think about multiplying those errors about how far you are from off from a half over all the variables in your set, you would still be exponentially in n off from the number of actual satisfying assignments. So that's not really good enough, but I'm going to formulate this as an intermediate goal. So can we take some statement like this about it being locally somewhat close to uniform within an additive small enough constant? And can we bootstrap it to a much better bound that's inverse poly off? Can we estimate this probability within an inverse poly, 1 over n to the some large constant c? So that'll be our goal. And I mentioned that uh, the algorithm is slightly strange because it starts off as a thought experiment. What I want to do is I first want to use, um, I want to show the existence structurally of something that will be very useful to me, which I'm going to call a local coupling. So here's what a local coupling is. I want to define some sort of iterative procedure. I'll tell you what I mean by that in a second, which what it does is it samples two, dis two assignments, A1 and A2, which has the property that it's faithful in the sense that A1 is a uniformly random satisfying assignment conditioned on x being true. A2 is a uniformly random assignment conditioned on x being false. So it's faithful in that A1 and A2 are random from two different halves, two different pieces of the solution space. But I also want it to be local in the sense that with high probability, A1 and A2 only differ on some small local connected component of variables. So I want to create a coupling that's not only faithful on the two sides it samples from, but even the ways that it's different is bounded. So that'll be the goal. And the catch, what makes this a little bit strange is that this procedure I'm going to give you for constructing this local coupling is going to require an oracle which we wish we had. It's going to be an oracle which can solve all of our counting and sampling problems. So this is really just a thought experiment about if I had this powerful oracle, what stru structurally it would tell me about the solution space. So let's imagine that we have this powerful oracle, which if we had it, we could all just go home because we could solve NP-hard problems and we could certainly solve this one. Let's say for any partial assignment, for any variable x, you're able to tell me what the probability is that x is true or false under the uniform distribution on satisfying assignments conditioned on the decisions you've made so far. So it's just the strengthening. You know, if I ask this oracle without fixing any variables what the probability is for x being true or false, then I answer my question. But it's even going to be able to answer conditional queries where I fix some of the variables. And I want to use this oracle to construct a local coupling. So let's see how we would do this just through a thought experiment. Imagine I started off with two partial assignments, A1 and A2. Well, A1 has to have x being true. That's a stipulation. A2 has to have x being false, that's a stipulation. And I want to build these out into actual satisfying assignments using my oracle, but in a way that I try and limit how, how much they can be different. So one thing I can do is I can take some other variable y and I can query my oracle on it. I can ask it in the A1 case. If I look at the uniform distribution on satisfying assignments conditioned on x being true, what's the probability y should be true or false? And I can do the same thing over here, but condition on x being false. And then I can couple these two uh, random variables as best as possible. So if, if y has a third chance of being true here and two thirds chance of being true here, then there's a third chance that I can just set them both to being true. And there's a third chance I can set them both to being false. And then there's a one third chance that I get different values. So I can just use this oracle to create the best coupling to make these y's agree as best as possible, subject to the constraint that they're faithful on the individual uh, distributions they're producing. So the marginals are both close to a half. So what this means is that we can usually couple these two variables. We can often set them to be the same thing. And let's say we even got into a good situation where you know, y was true. And let's say these are all monotone clauses just for simplicity. So when there's a true variable, they're satisfied. Now we can do this for tons of other variables. I claim in this case we would be in great shape that we would have a local coupling. Because what went right for us was that we queried a bunch of variables around x, because they're contained in other clauses that contain x. 
but they all got the same value on the two sides. And in fact, every clause that contains x is already satisfied because it already has at least one true variable inside it. So in that case, in this good case, where all the clauses containing x are already satisfied, those clauses were the things which were different in these two worlds to begin with because they were true in one and false in the other. We've now extinguished their differences because the variables ended up the same. And the clauses, the clauses which are different because they have a different setting of the variables are now inactive because they're already satisfied. So in that setting, what's great is that every other variable in this picture now has the same exact marginal distribution because they're the same satisfying assignment from then on forward. So we've extinguished the differences in this good case. So if this happens, which happens with some constant probability, then what I claim is that the marginal distribution on the remaining variables is identical across the two worlds, and we can just build out our oracle and create this local coupling. Now there are a bunch of problems that can arise. So what happens, for example, if y takes on a different value because we couldn't perfectly couple these two? There's a constant chance that that happens, so it's something we have to deal with. And what you would do in this situation is you would just continue the process further on y. This is just some defect and you would just continue this process that's trying to extinguish the differences, but further out into your graph. <coughs> and there's even another problem. This is more subtle, which is that what if you encounter some situation where even though the variables are set to the same across the two sides, you now have that in one world, the clause is satisfied and the other one it's not. This would be problematic because there are other variables here which this clause is no longer active because it's satisfied. This one is active and it's pinned to being true. So if we ever had this kind of situation, then what we can do is we can just treat all of the variables that are within these clauses as being errors and continue this random process. So in this way, what you can do is that you can keep growing out your local coupling. Every time you encounter a failure of your local coupling, you just use your oracle to continue the procedure. And what you can show is that actually following you know, Alon's proof of Beck's version of the local lemma, you can show that these types of procedures don't go on too long. That after a logarithmic number of steps, you actually do reach a local coupling. So this is just a thought experiment about some structural property about the solution space that's very useful for our purposes, that there exist these local couplings. It sounds like it's on the right track for finding an algorithm because at a high level what we said was that we want to estimate the marginal probability for x and somehow it's only locally defined based on things that are logarithmic distance away. But that's actually a problem because even though the connected component is logarithmic you know, size, if I go out to the entire radius of log distance away, that's a polynomial number of nodes and I can't brute force search. So in fact, what's problematic is that I care about which logarithmic component and they can overlap in different ways. The way that one solution shows up as some logarithmic size connected component, it might show up another way as a different logarithmic size connected component and I could worry about the interactions between them. So it turns out that we're actually not that far away from an algorithm, as strange as this sounds. So I claim that once we know that this coupling exists, this local coupling, it actually is algorithmically useful. And this is the bizarre part. So what I want to do is I want to take a step back and interpret this coupling as flows on a tree. Sorry, could you say in words again what's a local coupling? So what are you given? And Yep. It's so the local. The usual yep. Yep. That's right. So uh, um, it's a coupling in the usual sense of a distribution. So you have uniform distribution on satisfying assignments where x is true, uniform distribution on satisfying assignments where x is false. I want a way to jointly sample from those distributions that they're not agreeing yeah. often, but they're locally agreeing. So with high probability, the two outputs there differ only in a logarithmic size connected component. Any logarithmic. Yeah, which could be I have no control over which logarithmic size connected component or the dependencies. Oh, size. I yeah, yeah. Number one. exactly. So what I want to do is, this is the strange part, is that I want to interpret this oracle, this uh, local coupling that I created, as a flow in a tree. So imagine all of the possible paths that that coupling could take. I start off with my partial assignment having x being true in one of them and x being false in the other one. And let's say deterministically I choose which new variable to query after that. I'm going to query the oracle on my variable y. 
what this oracle really tells us is that we now have four different possibilities here. Y becomes true, 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 false, false, true, false, false. But the oracle is telling us the probabilities that we go along these different paths. If I had the oracle, there would be a way to figure out what the flow paths are along it. And so what happens is that if you continue this procedure as, you know, what are the randomized decisions you're making, what you're really saying is that after a logarithmic number of steps, you're with high probability locally coupled. So what I can do is that when I'm locally coupled, you know, that's only fixed part of the assignments. I only know some small number of the variables, how they're set to one and the other. But I can just, in principle, write down a list of all the assignments which are consistent with the A1 satisfy, uh, solution and a list of all of the assignments that are consistent with the A2 decisions. So this is uh, the object that we've really been thinking about. And what I claim is that actually one thing we can get out of this tree if we had it was it would give us a way from sampling a random satisfying assignment if we had this tree. Let's say Q is the probability in the original uh, solution space that X is true under a uniform distribution on satisfying assignments. I claim if I had this tree, here's a way to sample a random assignment, uniformly at random. The first thing I do is I follow a random root to leaf path along the tree according to the transition probabilities. And then when I reach that leaf node, I look at the A1 list, I look at the A2 list, I output a uniformly random element of those lists for each side. And then I flip my coin, which is biased with probability Q. If it comes up heads, I output the element of the A1 list. And in the other situation, I output an element of the A2 list. All this would be doing is it would be following the oracle as a way to generate a uniformly random assignment. So if we had this tree, which we would get from this oracle, we could output a random assignment. But now is the thing that makes it algorithmic. So what I claim is that there actually is a subtle balance condition that's met at the leaves that tells us something that's going to allow us to figure out these, this uniform sampling problem. So what I claim is the following. This is the crucial claim in there. And from this, the algorithm will follow. So if you take some leaf node that you reach and you have that A1 list of all of the assignments that are consistent with your choices of A1, and you take any assignment on that list, well, conditioned on that being the output from your sampling procedure, the chance of it being, you know, of reaching that um, leaf is the same for all the other entries of that list. Because once you fix that assignment, it already has made some of the decisions along the tree. The only thing that affects it is what happens on the A2 side. And those are things which happen independently of its choices. So what this means is that on that list, all of those assignments are actually treated the same. They actually have the same chance of having ended up at that leaf as the reason that they were outputting. So if you think about this, this balance condition, what this really means is that it means that if I take my Q bias, which is the fraction of assignments that are true versus the fraction of assignments that are false, and I look at the conditional probability conditioned on outputting A1, some element of that capital A1 list times the size of that A1 list, that that actually has to be equal to Q times N2 times P2, where P2 is the conditional probability condition on the output of the second list of reaching that leaf. So the way to think about this, why that balance condition is true, is that if I define a random variable now, which is minus Q, if I reach this particular leaf and output a true, uh, sorry, it's uh, 1 minus Q, and otherwise it's minus Q. If I reach that leaf and output some assignment where X is false, then its expectation is 0. Because when I follow the root to leaf path and output choose a random element of A and an element of the A2 list, then I flip my coin about which one to output. And then it has expectation 0 just by construction. But now if you think about it, well, you can express its expectation a different way which is, you know, what are the odds if I output a uniformly random assignment that it ends up on my capital A1 list? Is it just N1 over N? That's a necessary condition in order for me to reach the leaf. And then I have the conditional probability of actually reaching that leaf times the value of the expectation. That has to be equal to the other side. <coughs> so now a miracle happens, which is that if you think about this,
you can divide through this detailed balance condition. So Q over one minus Q is equal to this. I claim this right hand side I could compute. So if you tell me the leaf where I've only made a logarithmic number of decisions and I've created this local coupling, I can compute the ratio of the number of assignments that are consistent with one of them to the ratio of the number of ones that are consistent with the other. Because once they've locally coupled, everything that happens outside of the local coupling is irrelevant to this ratio. It only depends on a brute force check about that logarithmic size component. And if I had those probabilities along the trees, then I could compute P1 and P2 from them. And so if someone gave me some probabilities along that state tree, I could compute the ratio of N1 and N2, I could compute the ratio of the probabilities, and I could certify that actually this ratio Q to one minus Q is the correct ratio between the true and false satisfying assignments. So at the end of the day, what you can do is you can actually search for those probabilities that you wish you had through linear programming. All you have to do is you look for the flow splittings along the tree that meet this type of detailed balance condition that at each one of the leaves, that if you look at the ratio of true and false assignments under that local coupling, that you look at that ratio compared to the ratio of the probabilities, that that actually equals some value Q over one minus Q for all of the different leaves. The only way that you can do that is actually if the ratio of satisfying assignments where X is true to false is the same Q to one minus Q ratio. So the entire thing was this giant thought experiment about starting with an oracle, which we wish we had, which allows us to answer these conditional probability queries. We use that to construct a local coupling, which was really some sort of flow along a tree, but that implied a certificate for the actual ratio of true and false assignments, which now can be found once you know it exists through linear programming. And you know, if you look at this thing, it, um, it doesn't actually use the fact that the solution space is connected. So this is a very strange different algorithm than the usual in approximate counting that gets around some of the barriers of Markov chain techniques, but um, not sure where else it can be applied. And it seems like a very interesting question to understand the limits of what these types of techniques are. So let me end with this summary and tell you what I hope you got out of the algorithmic side. So the way around this problem that the solution space is disconnected was we showed the existence of a local coupling. This was just an information theoretic statement that we showed that there is a way to couple the true and false assignments, the uniform distribution on them, so that they're faithful and so that they differ on a logarithmic size component. Then we interpreted that iterative way for constructing a local coupling as actually flows in a tree, where this tree represents all the different trajectories that coupling procedure could have taken. And we did was we actually looked at the leaf nodes of that tree and found a balance condition on it. Because we could essentially delay our decision about outputting whether it's a true or false assignment until the end, that implied a balance condition at the leaves, which that balance condition was actually efficiently checkable by linear programming. And that gave us an algorithm for actually certifying the actual marginal probability for a variable. And you can actually use this to turn this into an algorithm for approximately counting and sampling. So anyways, I will end there. This is really all I know about this problem. But uh, there's lots of other interesting things to understand about this technique. What do you do in sampling problems when you have higher order constraints and correlation decay goes out the window? And what happens when you have sampling and counting problems which don't have nice structural properties like being unimodal? What if they're even disconnected? There are still things you can do even if they're really not Markov chains. So I'll end there and take any questions you guys have. Thanks.